And the question is this today, how can I know God? How can, how can I know God? Now, this is a question that our people are asking literally every day, wondering about it. Many books have been written about it, uh, some of them accurate, some of them inaccurate. Uh, I think the best thing for us to do to answer such an important question is to go to the book of God, which is the Bible, the Word of God, to get the answer to that. Uh, while with many people today, they, they think that, uh, you know, well, again, it, it means many things to many people. How can you get to know God? Unfortunately, what we do in these days and times in which we live, many people think of some sort of mystical, almost magical idea, that that's how you get to know God, uh, with visions and dreams, almost bordering on witchcraft, actually, in the occult, uh, looking for God in places that he's not going to be found, uh, uh, coming up with formulas and all these kind of things. No, the Bible is clear how to know God. Some others think in terms of the Bible, but still they lean towards a mystical view, and that is becoming more and more and more popular in the days in which we live. By the way, that is not a surprise because the last days there is going to be an increase, according to the Bible, of false teaching. And as a matter of fact, the Bible, Paul was very strong about the term he used, doctrines of demons. King James, doctrines of devils, okay, demons, that there are things that are deceptive, deceptive teachings. And so how can we know God? Let me ask you this morning, do you know God? Do you know God? Can we truly know God? Well, the answer to that is yes, but you have to do it in God's way. You have to do it the way God said. And so let me break this down and get very, very simple with you at the beginning of this message. And the first thing we want to cover is this. Can you know God? Yes. First, you must have the one true God, all right? There's a lot of quote-unquote gods you can know, but do you know the one true God? You might say, well, who is that? Now, remember, Hinduism has millions of gods. Many religions have many gods. The cults have many gods, as a matter of fact, some of the cults believe that if you continue on in their religion, you one day will be a god. Obviously, that's not biblical. Obviously, that's not true. As a matter of fact, that's blasphemous. So first, you must have the one true God, and this is the God of the Bible. We don't make any apologies about that. All of the rest of the gods are either non-living or demons hiding behind a facade of religion of one kind or another. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah 45. You know, we know verses from the New Testament, strong verses such as Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Uh, uh, John 14, 6, uh, Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Yeah, those are all great. Do you know that those distinctions and those, that narrow type of thinking is also found in the Old Testament? It's found there as well. Look at it with me, Isaiah 45 and verse 5, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. Whoa. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Verse 6, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. That's pretty exclusive. Go with me a little further down in chapter 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I'd say that's pretty exclusive, wouldn't you? Turn with me over to the New Testament, John chapter 17. John chapter 17. So the God, the one true God, is the God of the Bible. You might say, well, don't you, uh, shouldn't we respect uh, the other gods of other religions? Well, let me, 
let me uh, clarify that. Respect the other gods? No, I have no respect for the other gods. Respect the right of people to choose those other gods? Yes, we respect the right. We, we live in a free world, okay? A free society in the sense of you can make your own choices. Now, that doesn't mean your choices are right, but we, we respect and we stand for the right to be able to make those choices. But that doesn't mean you're right. In John 17, verse 3, it says this. Jesus says in verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Look at that. They, they may know thee. This is Jesus talking to the Father. That they may know thee, uh, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Sent. Now we know, of course, this is Jesus talking to the Father. Of course, we know that Jesus himself is God. Turn with me to 1 John, towards the end of your New Testament. 1 John chapter 5, in verse 20. 1 John 5, verse 20, it says, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. You notice the term, though, Jesus, his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. And so you have to have the one true God. That's where we begin. You, uh, if, if you want to know God, obviously I would think you would want to know the one true God. He's the God of the Bible. Okay? God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But secondly, you must believe in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior. This opens up the relationship to where you can know the one true God. Uh, you have trusted in him that he is God who died on the cross to pay for your sins and that he rose again. That is what makes you a child of God. You're believing in the gospel. The gospel is the good news. The good news is that Jesus is God who died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And all of that to make a full payment for our sins. That's why we call him the Savior because through what he did, we can have eternal life. You can't go to heaven any other way. It is only through Jesus Christ. And so you must believe in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior. Go with me over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, the Gospel of John. And look at the, uh, look at the terms here. You know, I, I love the clarity of Scripture, don't you? The clarity of Scripture. Here in John chapter 1... It's talking in the context about Jesus, and it says this, He came unto his own, his own people, and his own received him not. Of course, we know he was, generally speaking, rejected by the Jews, not by everyone, but generally. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. How do you receive Jesus Christ? By believing on his name. The name Jesus, God who is our Savior. Christ, of course, and I know I say this often, but Christ was not his last name. Now, I say that because there are people who actually do think that because they've just, they haven't learned any differently, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm Tom Kakuza, okay? Uh, well, who was he? Well, he was Jesus Christ. And so if you would have had a Yellow Pages or a, a regular phone book back then, uh, people would have thought, oh, I'll find him in here. He's under C for Christ. No, that's, you're not going to find him that way. If he, if he would have been listed anywhere, anyway, it would have been Jesus of Nazareth. If he would have been listed anywhere, Okay. But obviously, they didn't have phone books back then, as far as we know. Well, I'm sure they didn't because they didn't have phones. <laughs> Jesus, God who is our Savior. Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one. 
When you believe in him, you are trusting in him, you're putting your faith in him that he is God who is your Savior, the promised Messiah. You're trusting in him for your way to heaven. And when you put your faith in him, he gives you eternal life. Look at, again at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood. In other words, you didn't get to heaven because of your lineage. Nor of the will of the flesh, you're trying hard. Nor of the will of man, you've come up with a scheme in your mind. But you're born how? The only way you can be spiritually born, of God. God is the one who has to give you the new birth. God is the one who has to give eternal life. And so when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, you become a child of God. Romans 5.8 says, God commendeth or displayed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, he died for us. Have you ever thought about that? That means he died as a substitute for us. He died in our place, okay? You might say, well, I know Jesus died on the cross, pay for sin, but uh, I'm going to do good works too, just in case this is not right. <laughs> what that means is that you don't believe it. You don't believe the message. You don't believe the gospel. If, if you are trusting in anything but Jesus Christ to get you to heaven, you are not trusting in Jesus Christ. If you're trusting in your good works, then you're trusting in your good works. You might say, well, why can't it be both? Because the Bible says that it can't be both. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law keeping the commandments of God. No, the Bible says it's not by the works that we do. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Notice it. We have it up here as well. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. How are we saved? If someone was to say, how are we saved? The answer is by grace through faith. I say, what about good works? Well, look what it says. Not of yourselves not something you can do. It is the gift of God. That means it's free. Now, verse 9, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you know I had a Church of Christ member years ago, not a member in our church, but the religion, the, the, the Christian uh, false religion Church of Christ. Uh, and I know some people won't like that, but they believe in works for salvation, so it's a false religion. Okay, it's what it is. The Church of Christ believes you have to do five things to be saved. The Bible says you only have to do one. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Oh, no, no. You have to turn from all your sin. You have to be water baptized. Okay, all these, all these different things that you have to do. No, friend, only faith in Jesus Christ. It's not of works. It's not something you do. It's what Christ has done for you. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I had this man tell me this. Where it says not of works, that means bad works. You know, kind of, isn't that kind of a no-brainer? Bad works? It, it's not of bad works. Oh, so, so you think God has to tell us you're not going to go to heaven by, by murdering, by killing, by robbing, by all of these things? Everybody knows that. But see, Satan wants to deceive you into thinking, oh, no, you, you, you got to do good works too. And they'll misquote or they'll misapply James too. After all, faith without works is dead. Okay, well, that's not what James is talking about. James isn't saying you have to have faith and works to get to heaven. Okay, James is saying those of us who are saved, we should exercise our salvation in a profitable way and use our lives for Christ. But living for Christ, whether you obey or disobey, that doesn't get you to heaven. The way to heaven is through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. I'd say, well, I, I'm, I'm not convinced of that. Well, friend, you better get convinced before you die. Because if you die trusting in yourself, you'll be lost 
forever. Because you are not accepting the, the payment Jesus made for your sins. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5 in verse 13. Notice what it says. 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. There it is again. We saw that in John 1. Here it is. We see it again. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Look what it says. That you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know why people don't know that they have eternal life? Do you know why a Calvinist does not understand or does not know for sure that they have eternal life? Because they're still looking at the way they live their lives to get them to heaven. Whether they're going to be faithful to the end or not. That is a very confusing position to have. Friend, I know I'm going to heaven when I die. It has nothing to do with the way I live. It has everything to do with, with what Christ did for me on the cross. The only way you're saved is by trusting in Christ. Okay, We like to illustrate it. Uh, this way, if this represents you and me, we'll let my wallet represent all the things we do wrong. Those are sins. God loves us, but he hates our sin. Sin keeps you apart from God. You cannot get to heaven with your sin. You have to be sinless in the eyes of God. All your sin has to be taken care of, gone, if you're going to make it to heaven. If you die with your sin, you'll be lost forever in hell. God will not let you in to heaven with your sin. The wages of sin is death. It means separation, okay? Religion says do good works. Get baptized. Give money. Come to church. Now, they all may be good things, but they won't save you. They won't take care of the sin problem. You need a death payment for your sin. So you have a choice. Either you will Say, I'll be responsible for these, and I'll spend forever separated from God, God's wrath being poured out on you. Or you'll say, I'm going to trust in Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus came, because we couldn't save ourselves. He came, and when he died on the cross, he took our sin upon himself. He made the payment, leaving us nothing to pay for. He rose from the grave. If you believe or trust in him that he did that for you, the moment you do, he gives you everlasting life. And he even says, listen, if you'll believe or trust in me, you can know that you have eternal life. That's what it says right there, 1 John 5, 13. Not guess, not hope, not wish. No. We sang the song this morning. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. I'll be there, not, well, I hope I'm going. Isn't that amazing? It's a wonderful truth. So number one, you need to have the right God, the one true God. Number two, you, you must believe in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior. Now remember, what are we talking about? How can I know God? This is the way, according to the Bible, that you get to know him. Once a person has trusted Christ, they become a child of God, and then we have the privilege of getting to know our Heavenly Father better. Now this comes into it. And this is, this is where we're going to answer the question, how can I know God? Or some people say, how can God be real in my life? Well, he is real in your life, but you're talking about some sort of an experience, and we're going to talk about that. See, the Lord wants to become more and more real to us in our everyday lives. And so the question is, how can we really know Christ personally and for him to truly be real to us. He is real, but how can you know him personally? Okay, here we go. Third point is this. The answer is this, a willing obedience to his word. Here you go, a willing obedience to his word. That is the gateway into getting to know the Lord. That is the gateway for him to become real in your life, real in the sense of you experiencing a closeness, an intimate walk with him. It is through a willing obedience to his word. While obedience is always right, it is not all that God wants. Now, that's not a contradiction to what I just said, because I left out a word. 
It's the word willing. It's the word willing. Can I tell you this? You can be raised in a Christian home or a religious home, and you may even be a believer in Christ. But if you have, if you have no desire as a believer to walk with the Lord, to know him, to obey his word, to get into the scriptures, to pray, to share the gospel. If you don't want to do that, and sometimes if you do, you do it reluctantly, that's going to damage your life because you are not going to get the blessings that maybe you would like to have. He's looking for a willing obedience because, uh, you know, we sing the song, as the deer panteth for the water, right? So my soul longeth after thee, as the deer. Do you long to know the Lord? Do you have a heart desire to know him? If you do, then you will apply yourself as God wants you to. For us today, the only way to truly know Christ personally is to have a willing obedience to his word. Now, you might say, well, I kind of would like that, but I don't know how willing I really am for that. I mean, I, I, I kind of maybe, you know, depends on all this. Let me ask you a question. Are you willing to be made willing? Maybe you lack motivation. How do, you, how do you break that bind? Well, I'd like to have it, but I'm not really very willing. How do you, how do you break that issue? Well, go with me to John chapter 14, and this passage is key. John 14, in verse 15, Jesus said this, now, notice what he didn't say. He, he, he does not say this in John chapter 14. He does not say this. If you don't keep my commandments, you're not saved. He doesn't say that. He's talking to his disciples. And see, the issue is not their salvation. The issue is their fellowship with him. Their issue is their walk with him. There, the issue he's talking about is, is how to have the intimate walk with the Lord, for him to be real in your life. And it says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me. People say they love the Lord. We'll talk more about the negative side of that, the phony, or, or the phony proclamation of that in just a couple minutes. But notice this, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now go to verse 21. He that, here we go, this is it, this is it. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me. You see, God knows the heart of man. He knows whether you love him or not. There are people who know how to go through the motions, but they don't love the Lord. They do it reluctantly. Some Christians will obey the Lord just enough to keep the Holy Spirit off their back as far as living under conviction all the time or getting chastened. Okay, okay, I'll do this. Okay, okay. That's not loving the Lord. Jesus said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and here it is, and will manifest myself to him. That means make myself known to him. All right? Do you want God to be real in your life as a believer? Love the Lord, keep his word, and he will make himself known to you. He'll become more real to you. The word keepeth here, it means particularly to watch or to observe attentively, to keep your eyes fixed upon. That, to me, sounds like somebody who's willing. Somebody who's saying, I want this. I'm pursuing this. I want to know the Lord better. I want him, I, I want to be, uh, in my experience, I want him to be closer to me. Now, I didn't say feelings. I said experience, because your feelings will come and go. 
okay? But this is how you get the reality in your life. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now notice under this, the keeping of Christ's commandments demonstrates our love for Christ. If we are truly keeping them from the heart, it is demonstrating that we love the Lord. That's why we're doing it. This has to do with motivation in the Christian life. And by the way, there are many motivations in the Christian life. And notice the promise. They will be loved of the Father, the Son will love them, and He will manifest Himself to them. In other words, the Lord will become real and close to the believer who willingly obeys the Lord and His Word. It doesn't mean if you don't love the Lord and keep His commandments, He doesn't love you. No, it's, it's, it's experiencing the love of Christ in your life. This has to do with the experience of the Christian. This doesn't have to do with the doctrinal truth that God is a God of everlasting love, which we covered recently. So the keeping of Christ's commandments demonstrates our love for Christ. They will be loved of the Father, the Son will love them, He will manifest Himself to them. Again, the Lord will become real and close to the believer who willingly, willingly obeys His Word. This is something you want, this is something you are going to pursue. You're, you're saying, this is what I want. I want. I want the Lord to be real in my life, okay? I don't want just be going through the motions of this. And what does it do? Now, here you go. And this is what I really want you to get today. It begins a cycle in your life of true Christian growth. This is where it begins, okay? When we obey, this leads to Christ being revealed to us. This leads to our love for Him growing. This leads to a greater willingness to obey, and as a result, that leads to more obedience, which leads to more knowledge of the Lord, more Him revealing Himself to us, which leads to more love for Him, more willingness, more obedience. You see the, uh, the uh, chart pro projected there, all right? Let me show it to you, okay? I'll, I'll go this way. Sorry, those of you who are streaming, okay? You're either looking at me or maybe you're looking at the chart. We'll see how this goes. Here's where it begins. This is true growth through obedience. And I'm talking about willing obedience, willing obedience. You might say, you know, I, I'm not super motivated, but I do want to do what's right. Okay, let's begin there. Are you watching? Obedience. Obey the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Listen, it's not your ideas. It's not what you want. If you want it, if you want the blessings of God, you have to do it the way God wants. You don't make up your own. Through obedience, that leads to Christ being revealed in your life. Jesus said, you keep his commandments, he will manifest himself to you. Now let me tell you something, folks. When you get to know the Lord... There's no regret in that. There's nothing repulsive in him. Okay? You know, you know let, let's be frank. Some people say, oh, I really, you know, that person, all that. After a while, you get to know him, it's like, oh, oh, boy, I really didn't know the way they really were. Not so with Jesus. There's nothing unlovely, nothing undesirable in him. He's perfect. Okay? He is, the mo he is the most perfect thing that we have in our lives and really the most desirable. And he wants us to know him. Through obedience to his word, he will be revealed. He'll make himself known. When he makes himself known, what's going to happen? Our love for him is going to grow. Here you go. Obedience, though, it starts with obedience. He reveals himself. As he reveals himself, we fall in love with him more. As we fall in love with him more, we become willing, more willing, 
more willing. Why? Because it's like, Lord, I'll do anything you want. I'll do anything you want. And that results in what? More obedience. Which results in him being more and more revealed, which results in us loving him more, which results in us becoming more willing, which results in more obedience, which results in Christ being more revealed, which results in, do you get the idea? This is how it works. This is how you grow as a believer. And folks, here's the thing. People who get a hold of this, Christians who get a hold of this, who start applying this to life, here's what happened. You know, we sing the song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. What happens is this, the things of this earth become unappealing because the thing that's most appealing to us is our precious Savior. And this is what God wants for every child of God. This is how you grow. This is how intimacy comes into your walk with Christ. This is how Christ becomes more real to you. And the stuff of this world, it's like, you know, the world comes, hey, what about this? What about that? Eh, man. No desire for that. What do you mean you don't have a desire for that? you got to be kidding me. You don't want to do this? No, not really. What do you want to do? I just want to walk with the Lord. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you what he's done for me. What are you, some kind of kook? Yeah. Well, you know what? We've got something so far better. You know how many hymns we have having to do with this issue? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold, right? He means more to us than anything. Where does that come from? How in the world does a person write that? That is what they're experiencing by the fact that they're saved by grace and they're walking according to the Word of God. And this is what God is doing in their life. When we continue to obey, this leads to a greater closeness to the Lord, which leads to a greater love for Him, which leads to a greater willingness to obey, which leads to more obedience. This is true Christian growth. Now, you notice in verse 21, let's go back to verse 21. And notice what it says. What it's talking about in verse 21 is this speaks of the blessings of experiencing God's love on a deeper level. God's love is always there, but to know and experience it personally is another issue altogether. I'll give you an example from my own life. The night I trusted Christ as Savior. Now, it's different for different people. I know, I know men in the ministry today or who've been in the ministry, and you, you talk to them and they say, you know what, the, the, the day I got saved, I fell in love with the Lord. The day I got saved. I mean, I just fell in love with him. And I hear that and I think, that is really great. Do you know, the day I got saved, I didn't fall in love with him. The day I got saved, I just wanted to tell other people how to be saved, how to get what I got. That's the way it was for me. But over time, I've fallen in love with him. Through walking with him, through willing obedience to the word of God, I've fallen in, in love with him. Okay? I still want people to know one doesn't replace the other. They go hand in hand. But do you see how this works? Now, I don't know what, what the, the, uh, the spiritual or mental makeup of of, of uh, some in the body, when as soon as they get saved, they fall in love with the Lord. That's great. It wasn't that way with me, but I know this. It's become that way with me. But that's over the years. It's a wonderful thing. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. A few minutes ago, I asked you this question. If you're not willing, are you willing to be made willing? Did you know what? That's an issue of obedience on your part, on my part. What do you mean? God is working in your life and mine as believers to make us willing. See, he knows some Christians are reluctant. Now, we can continue to fight him. We can continue to resist 
the conviction and the leading of the Holy Spirit, we can continue to resist it. Why would we want to? But we can. But see, here's what the Lord is doing. He's even working in our lives, not just to get us to obey. He's working in our lives even to get us to want to obey. Did you know that? So let me ask you a question. What excuse do we have? Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you. God, you notice, is working in us as believers. He's writing to Christians here. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So it begins with obedience. But you know what? God is even going one step back and saying, I want you, yes, to obey because that's the key that unlocks this true growth cycle in your life. But I'll even go one step back and I'm working in your life to get you to desire to obey to where this can happen. Is that not the grace of God? God wants our lives to be so blessed. He's not only working on us to get us to obey, he's working on us to be willing to obey. That's how much he wants to pour his blessings out on us. Now, let's go back to John 14, because we are going to look at a different aspect to this, which is very, very important. John 14, 22, it says, after the Lord gives that in verse 21, that's such a powerful, powerful um, statement. He that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved to my father. I will love him, manifest myself to him. Verse 22, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? See, Judas was thinking spiritually, or not spiritually, but uh, physically. Jesus is telling him, I'm going, aw I'm going away, guys, I'm going away. How are you going to manifest yourself? Well, he's not going to keep appearing, although he did a few times, certain ones, such as Paul. But he's saying it's another way. It's spiritually that he's going to manifest himself. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said, if a man love me, if you love me, you'll keep my words. See, obedience becomes easier when you fall in love with the Lord. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, not into him, unto him, and make our abode with him. This has to do with a close, intimate walk of fellowship. Our abode. In other words, he's, going, he's just going to be there. It's like you're going to be in a home together. All right? Intimate walk of fellowship. Now, you've seen the cycle. Let's go back and let's look at that cycle again. The true growth cycle on our chart. Because not only does it tell us how to have true growth, but sadly, folks, the opposite is true. When we disobey, okay, Christ starts becoming more distant in our lives. Our love diminishes. We become less willing to obey. When we then continue to disobey, that leads to more disobedience. That leads to the Lord seeming like he's further and further away, which makes us less and less willing. You see it? Through disobedience, Christ is hidden. Our love diminishes. We become less willing. Less willing to do what? Obey, which is disobedience. Christ becomes, seems like he becomes distant. Our love diminishes. Okay? We become less willing. By the way, this is the cycle. Every believer who leaves a Bible-believing and teaching church, this is what happens in their life. This is the pattern. You know, we've had more people get saved in our church. I can't tell you, thousands and thousands of people have been saved through this ministry. People get saved, they come out, they, man, they're excited, oh, this is great, I love, the, I love this church, I love this. They're always talking about how much they love this church. 
And they start growing and things are going great. And then after a while, they start missing. And they stop doing this and they stop doing that. And before you know it, they show up every once in a while. And before you know it, you never see them again. Now, I know the false teachers, they have a heyday with that. Well, see that? They were never really saved. No, it wasn't that they weren't saved. They were saved. What happened? They didn't continue to grow God's way. And they got distant. Their fire was put out, so to speak. They weren't, they weren't excited. They didn't have that, that, that on-fire attitude that every Christian should have, that zealous attitude. And they got further and further away. Look at verse John 14, verse 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Do you see that? He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. If you don't love the Lord, that eventually... And, and he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Now, now listen, you don't love him. What was that the result of? Keeping not his sayings. Let's go back to our chart for just a second. Let's put that up again. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Where does that go back to? Disobedience. Disobedience results in this diminishing which leads to less desire, which leads to more disobedience, which leads, leads to the Lord being more distant. Now, let me ask you a question. Is he really more distant? No. The Holy Spirit is in us. Jesus is there. It's just that we don't have the intimacy, the closeness. We're not experiencing how wonderful that is to walk in fellowship with him. If we do, if we do, our last point here, if we do not keep his words, we do not love him. You've heard the saying, and it's true, talk is cheap. I am so sick of people saying, oh, I just love the Lord, and they're disobedient to his word. Oh, I love the Lord, and they're living in sin. No, you don't love the Lord. You don't love, if you love the Lord... Yes, we still sin, but folks, you're not living in sin if you love the Lord. I say, I don't like that. Well, that's what it says. Isn't that exactly what verse 24 says? He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. See, there is an inseparable link between loving the Lord and obeying his word. Any Christian living in sin does not love the Lord. I didn't say they're not saved. I said they don't love the Lord. Because if you love the Lord, you keep his word. That's what Jesus says several times in this passage. As a matter of fact, can I go further than this? People who say they love the Lord but live in rebellion to his word, according to the Bible, they are liars. 1 John teaches that. By the way, 1 John 5, 3 says this, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. You love the Lord? What is the mark of that? You keep His word. You keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. No, they're not grievous. They're not heavy. They're not burdensome. If you love Him, but you don't want to keep His commandments if you don't love Him, you'd rather have rebellion. See, folks, how real is God in my life? How real is God in your life? I'm talking about your experience to him, okay? Let me tell you this. God wants his reality in your life and mine to be as real as the clothes on our body. He wants us to be close. He wants to be real to us. He wants us to fall in love with him. To serve him out of love for him. And as we do, we start knowing how he is. And the more you get to know how the Lord is, the more your Christian life will be benefited and you'll experience the blessings of God. You know, I've said this before and it's, it's true. If you have a 
Uh, now, God, it, by his very nature, is always God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He never changes. He's immutable. We know that. We know that. That's, that's a doctrinal truth that we know. However, our experience with him, with our Heavenly Father, on a daily basis has to do with how we view all the other issues and challenges that come our way. And I've mentioned this before. If you have a big God, you have little problems. If you have a little God, you have big problems. Let me close with this. Robert Dick Wilson taught Hebrew at Princeton Theological Seminary. Now, this is Princeton way back. <laughs> Not modern times, okay? Robert Dick Wilson taught Hebrew at Princeton Theological Seminary, and one of his students was Donald Barnhouse. Now, Donald Barnhouse is a Bible teacher of, of the past. Uh, Barnhouse tells of his going back to the seminary to preach after having graduated there 12 years earlier. Dr. Wilson came into Miller Chapel and sat down near the front. There is something rather intimidating about going back to the school where you were trained and you teach the scriptures to those who taught you. By the way, I've had this experience in my own life at the Grace Conference, and it's awkward. <laughs> at the close of the meeting, Dr. Wilson came up to Donald Barnhouse and said, If you come back again, I will not come to hear you preach. I only come once. I am glad that you are a big godder. When my boys come back, I come to see if they are big godders or little godders. And then I know what their ministry will be. Barnhouse asked him to explain. And he said, well, some men have a little god and they are always in trouble with him. He can't do any miracles. He can't take care of the inspiration and transmission of the scriptures to us. He doesn't intervene on behalf of his people. They have a little God, and I call them little godders. Then there are those who have a great God. He speaks, and it is done. He commands, it stands fast. He knows how to show himself strong on behalf of them that fear him. You, Donald, have a great God. He will bless your ministry. He paused a moment, smiled, and said, God bless you, and he walked out. Why did Barnhouse have a big God? He had a big God because he learned how to walk with him. And as you learn how to walk with the Lord, he becomes bigger, and he becomes more uh, uh, proficient, and the uh, solution maker and provider okay but that that it's always there but it's our realization of it that suffers because we either don't want to walk with the Lord or don't walk with the Lord I'm encouraging you today listen how can God be real in your life what you learn today will facilitate that it'll help you understand it it'll help you have that reality in your life there's nobody better for you and me but Jesus Christ, okay? Learn how to walk with him. Start with obedience, willing obedience. And as you are willingly obedient to him, he's going to reveal himself to you. As he reveals himself to you, you're going to fall in love with him. As you fall in love with him, it's going to motivate you. It's going to make you more willing to be more obedient. And it just goes around and around and around. But beware, if you quit obeying, things start falling apart. You can't have it both ways. Now, let me say, if you're here and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, as we saw, the God of the Bible is the one true God. And the only way for you to become a child of God is through trusting in Jesus Christ and Him alone as your Savior. Do it today. Do it today. Let's all bow in prayer, shall we? 
Today, as we close with every head bowed and every eye closed, uh, friend, if you've never put your faith in Christ, I'd say, I'd like to know God, okay? This is how it begins. God wants you to know him. As a matter of fact, God wants to be your Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to be your Savior. Have you ever trusted in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior? Would you do it right now? God knows your thoughts. He reads minds. He knows what you're thinking. You can get it settled. You can't save yourself. Quit trying. Quit trying. Instead, trust in Christ. He paid for your sins. He's offering you eternal life as a gift. All you need to do is trust in him, and he'll give you that eternal life. Would you trust him today, right where you sit? Trust him. Would you do that? Now, if today, for the first time, you've understood this, and today you trusted Christ as Savior, could I pray for you, not by name, I won't embarrass you in any way, could I pray for you? I have some things I'd like to pray for you today. I won't embarrass you, but it, I'd just love to know that it made sense to you today, and today you trusted Christ. Once you're saved, you're saved forever. He keeps you saved. But will you trust Christ today if you've never done that? Is there anyone who would just slip up their hand and say, you know, I never understood this till today, but today I trusted Christ. Would you pray for me? Is there anyone? Just slip it up, put it down. Is there anyone? Let me say this today. If you're a, a Christian and maybe you're just kind of, you're here because you feel like, oh, I need to be there. I'm supposed to be there, so I'll be there. And you know what? I'm glad you're here. But are you here willingly? Are you here because you really want to be here? Are you here because you came to worship today to learn of Christ? How's your walk with the Lord going? How is that? If you haven't been walking with him, this would be a good time as a believer to confess your sin to the Lord. You've gone your own way. Still a child of God. Can't lose that once you've got it. But confess your sin to the Lord, get back in fellowship with him, and now start that obedient walk again. And watch what he does. Watch what he does. He's amazing. We have a great God. We have the only God who is great. And what a blessing to walk with him. Father, thank you for loving us, and I pray we could all say from our hearts, we love you. We love you. Thank you for what you've done for us, and thank you that you've given us clear path to knowing you more, knowing you in a greater way. And it's through walking with you in willing obedience. Thank you, Father, for this path that you've shown us. I pray as your children we would desire that. And Lord, if, 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 if we're believers who don't desire that, that we would get alone with you and, and work this out and confess our failure in this, Lord, because you never fail. You desire to be real in our lives. We thank you, Father, for this day. I pray that everyone here knows for sure they're going to heaven through faith alone, in Christ alone. We ask for your guidance, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening, and would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.